All right, we're going to look at one of the last two big deal theorems in our textbook. So we are nearing the end of that big calculus book you've been working on for a very long time. All right, so let's look at Stokes' theorem, look at what it says, make sure we're clear about all of it, and then we'll look at some examples here. So it says, if C is a simple, closed, piecewise smooth space curve. All right, so we've talked about simple, closed, and piecewise smooth before. So simple means it does not cross itself. Closed means that its starting point and ending point are the same point. Piecewise smooth means that we can break that into finitely many pieces joined at the endpoints, each of which have a smooth parameterization. And here we're talking about a space curve, so that curve is in R3. And then S is a surface enclosed by C with positive orientation inside C. So I'm going to start with positive orientation here and then I'll draw a little picture of surface enclosed by a curve. All right, so positive orientation is what is indicated in this little diagram here. It is another right-hand rule. We've had many right-hand rules. The idea is that if you put your fingers of your right hand and if you put your fingers in the direction of the orientation of the curve, so that's indicated by the little arrow here, and curl your fingers around the orientation of that curve, you have a vector that is along your thumb. And the idea with the positive orientation is that if you put your fingers in the direction of the orientation of the curve, you can define a normal vector to the surface that follows that right-hand rule. All right, the other idea here is thinking about what does it mean to have a surface enclosed by a curve. So if I imagine, say, just a circle in R3, uh, there are probably many surfaces that you could think of being enclosed by that curve. So you could think of the plane enclosed by that curve as one of the surfaces, but you could also perhaps think of a sphere or a part of an ellipsoid or a part of a paraboloid that has as one of its cross sections that curve. So there might be many, many surfaces that can be enclosed by that curve, and that's actually something that we'll exploit when we look at some examples later. All right, F is a vector field with continuous first partials on an open region containing S and C. All right, so the big deal right there, making sure that our vector field F has continuous first partial derivatives on our region that we're interested in. Then the left side of this integral here is a work or circulation integral. And it says that the circulation around C, notice the counterclockwise orientation on the arrow there, the circulation around C of this vector field is equal to the surface integral. Notice that this is a surface integral over S and with a surface area differential of the curl vector dot N. And that N is that normal vector that we can define to the surface with that orientation, that right-hand orientation. And so this theorem should look very familiar to you. The conclusion of this theorem looks a lot like the circulation curl form of Green's theorem. And in fact, Green's theorem really is just a two-dimensional special case of Stokes' theorem. We did Green's theorem first. It's a little easier to draw pictures and think about for Green's theorem. But this is our circulation and this is the k component of curl. Remember when we did Green's theorem, we used that k vector, but if you think about the geometry and the orientation of a curve in the xy plane, if you have counterclockwise orientation and you use that right-hand rule, then the k vector would be coming straight out toward you, and so that would follow that same orientation as our n vector in Stokes' theorem. So in essence, you can think of this as a generalization of Green's theorem, to more dimensions, or you can think of Green's theorem as a special case of Stokes' theorem reduced to two dimensions. All right, so this is about work integrals, so that's important to understand when you're thinking about are you going to be using Stokes' theorem or not. And I have two examples here. Find the circulation of F along C, where C is the perimeter of a triangle formed where in the plane given by that equation, intersects the coordinate planes. And notice that my two examples here are almost exactly alike, except all I've done is change that J component of my vector field equation. Okay, so let's just think a little bit about the different things that we know about work integrals. It's been a while since we've done any work integrals. So we can evaluate a work integral just as a line integral 
by just evaluating the f dot dr. So the parameterization of our curve gives us our r, and then we can find our dr, f dot dr, and evaluate that line integral. So one way we can do work integrals is that. We also had fundamental theorem of line integrals, which applies to certain work integrals. You have to make sure that you're in a conservative vector field in order to use that. You can check that by determining if your curl vector is zero. If you are in a conservative vector field, then you can use fundamental theorem of line integrals, and instead of evaluating the work integral directly, you can find your potential function and do f of b minus f of a. And then the third way that we have to do work integrals, depending on if we're in two dimensions or three dimensions, would be to use Stokes' theorem if we're in three dimensions, or Green's theorem if we're in two dimensions. So this just provides that third way to handle work integrals, circulation integrals, if you're in three dimensions. All right, so let's look at both of these and think about whether any of those theorems would apply or how we might calculate these two. All right, so both of these ask us to find a circulation of F along C. So that word circulation indicates to us that the curve is closed. So that's important. If the curve were not closed, then Stokes' theorem and Green's theorem would not be able to apply. So circulation of F along C, and C is a perimeter of a triangle formed when this plane intersects the coordinate plane. So that defines our curve, and our curve is in R3. I'll draw a little picture of the curve down here below. So when I draw the plane, uh, that intersects the x-axis at 4 and the y-axis at 2 and the z-axis at 1, and so that triangle formed when that plane intersects the coordinate planes is our curve, so three line segments, and that is counterclockwise when viewed from above, so the orientation would be like this. Okay, so there is my curve. It is simple and piecewise smooth. So I would not use Green's theorem here because I don't have a two-dimensional curve, but I could possibly use Stokes' theorem. I could possibly use fundamental theorem of line integrals if that applies. And if not, then I can just go back and evaluate my work integral, and I can just parameterize each of these line segments and evaluate the work integral that way. So whether you're going to use fundamental theorem of line integrals or consider using Stokes' theorem, you're going to probably start by calculating that curl vector. Remember, that's what we did when we were deciding whether to use Green's theorem or fundamental theorem of line integrals. We began by calculating the curl vector. So for my two different vector fields here, I'm going to get slightly different curl vectors. For the first example, I will get the zero vector, which is very exciting because that tells us that I can actually use fundamental theorem of line integrals and really be done with this problem, actually. So this tells us that fundamental theorem of line integrals applies, and so I can think about a potential function evaluated at the terminal point of my curve minus the potential function evaluated at the initial point of my curve, but since the curve is closed, points B and A are the same, so I end up with just zero for my work for the first example. All right, so that's one of the best kind of problems where if you recognize the theorems that you can use, the problem turns out super simple. All right, the second problem doesn't turn out quite so simple. So in the second problem, I did not get the zero vector, so my vector field is not conservative, which means I cannot use fundamental theorem of line integrals but I can consider using Stokes' theorem. So I'm going to write down the two integrals on both sides here for Stokes' theorem. Okay, so Stokes' theorem tells us that because I have a vector field with continuous first partials, notice that all of my component functions for my vector field are very simple polynomials, nice continuous first partials everywhere. I have a closed curve that is simple and piecewise smooth in R3. I can define a surface that is enclosed by that curve. That would just be the simplest one would be the plane we actually use to get the curve that I can use Stokes' theorem if I prefer. And so what Stokes' theorem says is that either way you're going to get the same answer. So I could do this side where I would actually just do the line integral. I would need to break my curve into three pieces, so I would parameterize each of my three pieces, and then I would just evaluate three separate line integrals. So that is a perfectly fine way to do this line integral, and actually sometimes I would prefer that to doing surface integrals.
Surface integrals can be a lot of work. Uh, you've got the d sigma, the surface area differential that you have to deal with. I'm going to have to think about a normal vector to my surface and remember that for surface integrals you end up having to convert them to double integrals. So unless my curl vector is very very simple I often don't choose to evaluate the surface side of this although you certainly could. In this case though our curl vector is very very simple so it is probably simpler to actually evaluate the surface integral side of this. So let's go ahead and do that for this problem. So my curl vector is 0, 0, 4. The next thing I need to think about is what is my surface and what is that n vector. So our surface s is going to be this plane that we started with and now I need an n vector that is perpendicular to that surface and oriented upward using that right hand rule. All right, so my n vector, I can use the same thing that we use when we define flux integrals, the gradient vector divided by its magnitude, plus or minus of that, where g of x, y, z gives us the equation of our surface. All right, so my g of x, y, z is x plus 2y plus 4z. So for this one, my gradient vector is also very simple. We'll just have 1, 2, Four. The magnitude of that gradient vector will be square root of 21. And when I think about plus or minus, I need to think about whether this vector is pointing in the direction of the vector that I drew in my picture there. And so if I think about all of the components on my vector there being positive, we can look at this picture and notice that yes, we want all of the components of our vector to be positive. So I'm going to use for my normal vector 1, 2, 4 divided by square root of 21. Okay, so that gives me my n vector, my d sigma, and my surface integral. I need to think about where I want to do a one-to-one -one projection and set up my surface integral over that. So this surface has a one-to-one -one projection into any of the three coordinate planes. I'm going to actually choose to project this one back into the yz plane just because I haven't done any like that. So we're going to project back into the yz plane. So I'm going to set up my surface integral based on my projection into the yz plane. And so that will just be that little triangle that we had over there in the yz plane. Remember our plane intersected the z-axis at 1 and the y-axis at 2. So this little triangle over here in the yz plane is our ryz. My curl vector was 0, 0, 4. My n vector is 1, 2, 4 over square root of 21. Since I'm using my equation of my plane for my surface and I'm projecting into the yz plane, I will need to solve that equation of that plane for x and calculate some partial derivatives here. And when I simplify that expression inside that radical, we will get cancellation with my square root of 21 on the denominator here. So I do my dot product and I get 16 dA. So this is just 16 times the area of my ryz, which is just a triangle. So I don't actually need to do the integration for this one if I recognize that that's 16 times the area of my triangle. So I have positive circulation, which means that the vectors in the vector field are more lined up with the curve than against the curve as I move around there. All right, so in general, I don't choose to do the surface integral side of Stokes theorem a lot. Unless my curl vector is very, very simple, the surface integral can sometimes actually be more work than just doing the three line integrals. There are a few problems in the homework actually that ask you to set up both sides and I think the intent of those problems is to sort of compare which side is easier and which side is harder in that particular problem that you're looking at.